Well, good morning. If you will be turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 is where we're going to spend the majority of our lesson this morning. It's good to be with you all this morning. We've got a really good crowd here this morning. I see some spots where some folks normally are. I know some are out sick and some may be away, but uh, thankful for the presence of everyone here this morning. It's good to be together on this beautiful day that God has blessed us with, that we can gather together and worship our God and study His Word. So thankful for the encouragement that we can bring to one another this morning. So a couple weeks ago, we started looking in Matthew chapter 13 at some of the parables of Christ. And we talked about in our introduction to that about how Jesus would teach at different times using parables. In other words, we said that Jesus would take a very easily understood illustration and He would use that illustration to communicate a teaching that might be more difficult to understand. We may have defined, I think, a couple weeks ago a parable as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Well, Jesus is going to continue to teach on different topics using parables as illustrations. For example, a couple weeks ago, we talked about in the parable of the sower, we saw that people react to the Word in different ways. For example, some reject the Word because of a hardness of heart. Some you know, are caught up with matters of the world and it prevents growth. And we saw in that particular parable, it was compared to the good seed, or, only, or the, good, the good ground, I should say, were only those with receptive hearts, those with, that had an open mind to the Word, they would receive the Word, they would bear fruit that the Word or that seed was intended to bear. When we get to verse 24, it's interesting because you just drop a little bit farther down from the parable of the sower. And we have another parable, this time still, with that same agricultural theme. Uh, depending on your translation, you may see that this next parable, sometimes it's titled the parable of the tares, uh, my translation actually calls it the parable of the weeds. Tares really isn't a term that we use, or at least I don't use modern day today, so I'm just going to call it the parable of the weeds this morning. Um, now, it should have been mentioned in that last le lesson a couple of weeks ago. Um, it should have been mentioned that as we have another parable with an agricultural theme, notice that Jesus is using illustrations that would have been very easily understood by the people at that time, especially people in a farming community. Uh, later on, he's actually going to use other illustrations, for example, one that would appeal to fishermen or someone that had that type of, of background. And while for we, you know, while we for the most part can make sense of these things, particularly as sometimes he spells things out for us, and he's going to do that this morning, he was certainly teaching in a way that would have primarily been helpful for the people at that time. You know, probably today I was thinking about it, if he were to teach in parables today, what might he do? He might make uh, you know, a sports analogy or illustration of that regards, maybe something tied to technology, something that we would understand today in, in our time. But this parable, like I said, is one of the few, like the parable of the sower, that after he tells the story, he later gives an explanation. So first this morning, we're going to look at the story, and then afterwards we'll consider his explanation of what he was trying to illustrate. So starting in verse 24, and you can read this with me on the overhead, or if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. In Matthew chapter 13, we'll start in verse 24. It says, He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest, it, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. So notice there at the beginning of verse 24, first and foremost, the story begins, Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven essentially may be compared to this illustration that he's about to give to them. So he's teaching about the nature of the kingdom. We've seen that he's taught on this theme several times already in the book of Matthew. This is no different. And then at the end of verse 24, the story it describes this man, probably a farmer based on what he's doing, who went out sowing good seed in his field. So just like that first parable we saw a couple weeks ago, a man sowing the seed. This one's a little bit different though. Verse 25, we see that specifically it was wheat that he was growing. 
And a commentator pointed out that wheat was something that was grown in a lot of different places in Palestine where they would have been. But, verses 25 through 26, during the night when the farmer's men, when they were asleep, we see that the enemy of the farmer, he came in and he sowed weeds among that wheat that the farmer had sown. And then, since they were all planted side by side with one another, as those good plants started to come up, well, you see the weeds also came and grew along with them. One thing I thought that was interesting as I was researching this, that word there that's translated as, as weeds or tares, I'm not going to tr try and pronounce that this morning, but it's a Greek word that refers to a particular type of weed that grew in Palestine. And what's interesting is that it very much resembled wheat up until a certain point. It resembled it, but it was worthless. And I thought that was interesting because it wasn't until the plants had grown up that the, the, the man's servants, they realized that something was off. In other words, they were able to grow around the good plant for a while before they were noticed by anyone. The story goes on when the servants we saw in the text, they realized what had happened and they asked whether or not, well, first they asked, had he you know, given or had he planted good seed? And the master goes on to make the statement that clearly this was something the enemy had done. So then the question, well, what do we do about it? Should they then grow and try and pull up the weeds? Well, no, they can't do that. He says, you know, the wheat and the weeds, they were growing together. Probably at this time they were more mature. The roots and the grounds may have been, you know, intertwined with one another. So you couldn't pull up the weeds without endangering risk to the good wheat or the, or the good plant or the good wheat. So, the master determined, let's let them all grow up. Side by side, grow to maturity. And then at harvest, the reapers, they would then be able to identify which was the weeds and which was the good wheat. The weeds would be gathered first. They would be bound together. They would be burned. And then the wheat would be gathered into the barn. So what does this all mean? What was the lesson? Well, thankfully, with this parable, like the parable of the sower, we don't have to wonder because Jesus spells this one out for us as well. Dropping down to verse 36, we see that the disciples, they would later ask him the question, what, you know, what this parable meant? And he gives them an explanation. Starting in verse 36, he says, Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father, he who has ears, let him hear. So in his explanation, Jesus first goes through and he identifies who or what all the different elements of this story are, at least the, the ones that are important. So verse 37, for example, we see that the farmer is the son of man. So here Jesus, of course, is referring to himself. Jesus Christ in this parable is the one sowing the good seed. Then in the middle of verse 38, we see that the good seed, they are the sons of the kingdom. In other words, the seed that is sown by Christ are those that belong to Him. They're God's children. Verse 39, we see that the enemy that was referred to is the devil. Earlier in the parable, he was referred to just as the enemy, the one that sowed the bad seed. But the enemy here is clearly identified as the devil. He has been an enemy of God's plan. If you, you know, I was thinking about that. If you know that the farmer, you know that that's Jesus and he has an enemy. You don't even have to spell out who that is. We know who the enemy is. He's been the enemy since Genesis chapter 3. Well, then from the enemy, the end of verse 38, the weeds are the sons of the evil or the enemy. So naturally, as the good seed, as it represents God's children, that which was planted by Satan, well, those are his sons. Beginning of verse 38, we see that the field is the world. I'm going to stop right here and talk about that for a second because I think this is a particular part that we need to make note of. One confusion that people sometimes get is the field is not the church. Sometimes there's some applications based on that. The field is described, it says it's the world. 
And that needs to be clarified because, again, some are confused later on about how the Son of Man, it says that He's going to send His angels and they're going to come and gather out of His kingdom. And often when we see a reference like that to Christ's kingdom, we immediately think of the spiritual kingdom or the church, things of that nature. However, the wheat and the weeds, they're going to grow in the field which represents the world. Don't forget about passages such as Ephesians chapter 1. Christ has authority over all. He, he is king. He is above all. Beginning of verse 39, we also see, and also it mentions in verse 40, the harvest, the thing that comes at the end after they've grown, well, he says that's the end of the age. In the parable that we read earlier, the, the original story, you'll remember that the weed and the weeds, they were allowed to continue to grow up until the harvest. And Jesus, again, he says that that harvest, it represents, my English standard says the end of the age, uh, the King James, I believe the New King James may say this is the end of the world. It phrases it just a little bit differently. And then, at the end of verse 39, we see that the reapers, well, they're the angels. The angels, they have the task of coming in. They have the task of separating the weeds from the wheat. They'll remove the weeds, and then they'll cast them into the fire, we saw in the original story. So several applications that I think we need to look at, and also, in addition to some applications, I want to talk about some observations that we also get from this parable as well. Some of these applications he spells out for us here at the end of that text. First being is that the unrighteous, they may resemble the righteous on the outside, at least for a period of time. And that's a point for us to consider. In the parable, you saw that the, the servants of the farmer, at some point along the way, we're not sure exactly when, at some point along the way, they realized that the weeds, well, they were growing alongside the wheat, but they probably didn't realize it until it was too late. Remember, we said that that type of weed that's referenced there in that text, it would have resembled wheat up until a certain point, up until nearly it was fully grown. I was thinking about that, that comparison, that, that parallel there, and I was thinking about a group that we've already seen several times in the book of Matthew already. We've already seen the Pharisees show up several times even up to this chapter that we're in right now. And we're going to continue to see them throughout the life of Christ. One passage that we haven't gotten to yet, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus referring to the Pharisees, He's talking about, He's making the statement about how outwardly, well, they appeared to be righteous, but inwardly, they were hypocrites. They were lawless. And I say that because it's very, in, you know, for one, it's easy sometimes for people of the world they appear to follow God. They appear to have religion. But I say that, and sometimes that's easily distinguished. But we're not exempt from that as well. It's easy even for us within these walls here on Sunday morning. Sometimes it's easy for us to have the appearance of righteousness. But inside, we're not wheat. Rather, we're a worthless weed. We also see another application of this. Christ, we see, is patient so that His people can grow. And I make this point from the original story back in verses 28 through 29. You remember the servants when they realized what had happened. They realized that those weeds were growing in the midst of the wheat. They asked whether or not they should go up and they should try and pull up the weeds from the field. And we saw in that story, Jesus didn't want them to do that at first. He didn't want them to pull it up, pull up the weeds because He knew that that would be a danger to the good. That reminded me of a passage in 2 Peter chapter 3. The context of that passage talks about how some were questioning whether or not the Lord was actually going to return because it seemed like it had been a long time. And Peter makes the point in that passage, you know, we ought not look at the length of time that we've been waiting, which to us and to them, it seems like a long period of time from our perspective. We ought not look at that length of time as a bad thing. Rather, he says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness. But He's what? He's patient towards you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is giving us time to repent. He does not want to prevent anyone from growing up if they will grow and bear fruit. I think that this parable, it reminds us of God's patience with us. We also see in application of verses 41 and 42, of how lawbreakers, well, ultimately they're going to face destruction. Because notice in verse 42, the parallel between the weeds and the unrighteous is that at the end of the world, they're going to be gathered. 
And what does it say? They're going to be burned in a fiery furnace. That doesn't give you warm, fuzzy feelings, does it? Of course, we understand from other passages, we understand the description here to be a reference to hell. Uh, Gehenna is a, a word that's often used in some, it, well, it's used the Greek word for hell in some places. Gehenna was a place, there, there was a place called Gehenna near Jerusalem, but that name is often used as a symbolic name for the final place of punishment for those that are judged by God to be unfaithful. Notice in verse 42, it is a place so horrible. How is it described? It's a place that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why weeping? Well, maybe it's a situation, the realize, realization or the regret of what led to them being in that place. Maybe that's the cause for the weeping. Gnashing of teeth. It's a place of misery. Agony. Just describing that this morning, it's not a topic that's comfortable for us to talk about, is it? But at the same time, it is a reality that the Bible warns us against. But understand, it's not a fate that God desires for anyone. He desires all men to be saved. But it is a reality for some. Notice those that are going to be sentenced to this destruction. There are those that are associated with sin and breaking the law. The New King James Version and King James Version phrases it a little bit differently. All things that offend. Revelation 21 verse 8 says that this includes those that are cowardly, those that are faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9-10 through 10 says that it is these that will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it lists the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, those that practice homosexuality, also thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, and the swindlers. Again, it's not a comfortable topic, but it's something that's being warned about in this passage. And it will be the fate for those that do not obey the Lord. Then in verse 43, we see one more thing. The righteous, it says, will shine like the sun. Now, I want to admit to you, I'm not 100% clear on, on the reference here. Uh, Brother Kyle Pope suggests that a possibility here is that this is the nature of God's people at the resurrection. Turning your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want to read a passage that I was reading through his, his notes and he pointed to this passage. I thought it might go well with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 53, I'm going to read real quickly. Paul writes, he says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must, be, must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Whether that's what he's talking about or not, you read through that passage, there is a clear contrast between the unrighteous and those that belong to the Lord. There's destruction, and then there's also obviously a better contrast to that. Paul was actually doing the very same thing in Philippians chapter 3. He was talking about how the fate of the enemies, that's destruction. But Paul said regarding God's people, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice verse 21, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. So that's the end of that parable there this morning. Just some thoughts from that. As we get to our conclusion this morning, it's kind of a strange way, I guess, strange place to leave, but that's where we'll leave it this morning. Jesus is continuing. We've seen... Two examples so far of him teaching in parables, specifically teaching about matters of the kingdom. In this parable, we've seen that God's people, we are going to grow in this world among the worldly and among the righteous. But as this passage demonstrates, there is going to come a point where the wicked and the righteous, well, they're going to be separated. The wicked will be punished and the righteous will be with God. The question I want to ask you this morning is how will God find you at the end of the age? Will you be that which resembles wheat? And again, I said resembles wheat. But it's just a worthless wheat. Or will you be one that He planted and one that is bearing fruit? If you're here today and you're not one of God's people, 
I would ask, why not change that? If you're here this morning and you're not in a right relationship with God, let me encourage you, change that. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. Maybe you have some questions about how to go about that and what you need to do in order to be saved. We would be glad to talk with you about that. Make sure you ask us if you have those questions. But if you're here this morning, you know what you need to do to get your life right with the Lord. You desire to do that now. You're invited to come forward as we stand and as we sing.